So I'm here with uh, Mark, Professor Mark B. Anderson, who is a guest professor here at Hampstead University, but uh, also a clinical psychology from Australia. And uh, we just came back from uh, a NISP conference, a conference for young sports psychology practitioners uh, in Europe. Um, and one thing you did there was that you did a workshop about transference and counter-transference. Mm. So, my first question, <laughs> what is transference? Well, transference comes originally from uh, psychoanalysis. And it is when the client in therapy begins to respond to the therapist in ways that are similar to how he or she may have responded emotionally, cognitively, behaviorally with significant others in that person's life. Like, like you, you relate to the therapist as, as though the therapist was somebody like your mother or your father or a grandmother or a brother or somebody else who in your life. And, and it was sort of that thought that transference was something that happened within therapy primarily. More modern takes on transference are that transference really is a foundation for most all of our relationships that go beyond the superficial in that the relationships we have with significant others in our lives have as a foundation our earlier relationships and that only that makes sense that you know, the relationships you form with parents and with siblings is a foundation for how we relate to other people and so that transference is not just something in therapy transference happens with between coaches and athletes between students and teachers between phd candidates and their supervisors and so the, the, it's a phenomenon that you might say is quite ubiquitous and even universal but it, and it's based on our earlier experiences and uh, there's lots of recent neuroscientific evidence for transference phenomena and so it's not it's something that we see and been talking about in clinical psychology for years and years it's not something that is talked about much in sport and exercise psychology. Oh, interesting. And, uh, so, uh, if I understand the process correct, it's it's something that are among us all, uh, but it's not that conscious process always. Or so, actually, the, the transference phenomenon can range from completely unconscious. I don't know why I'm responding to you this way. I just am. So I don't have a I don't have a conscious understanding of why I want to be closer to my therapist or why I I'm getting angry at my therapist or something like that. Or it can be quite conscious. It can be quite conscious. You know, oh my therapist is great. He reminds me so much of my uncle Freddie, and I just love my uncle Freddie. So it's like sitting there with him and being with Uncle Freddie. You know, so it can be quite a conscious phenomenon too. But so it can range from completely unconscious to quite conscious. Hmm. Interesting. And um, so, and yeah, I'm thinking and counter transference also. I mentioned it before. Uh, yeah. So that's the in the other way. Or yeah, you just you turn it around. Turn around. It's when when the therapist begins to respond to the client in ways that uh, the therapist has responded to significant others in his or her life. Um, I was in the middle between two sisters and uh, I always felt it was kind of my job growing up is to protect my sisters and so sometimes I respond, I've often early in my career responded with a lot of very protective sorts of feelings toward my clients. So I had these sort of big brother kind of transference to, to, to clients and so and the thing is that transference and countertransference are sometimes viewed, especially countertransference, as something negative. They can be, but they can also be quite positive in that if, if I'm responding really positively with a caring sort of way because of my experiences to my client, my client perceives that care and that, that sense of safety, and so the client begins to like me more, and, and that 
that positive transference and countertransference helps to move therapy along. It actually is actually the vehicle through which therapy works. Huh. So these close connections. Yeah, they it's they a relationship. And, uh, positive transference and countertransference uh, represent really you know the some of the best things in in human relationships, and that's what we want to want the client to experience is a healthy, caring relationship with the therapist. Hmm. Nice. And uh, looking at sports, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned coaches and stuff like that. Do you yeah. have an example that would be uh, suitable for a sport context? Well, yeah, I think, I think um, you can look at in terms of sports, especially with uh, between coaches and athletes, you see transference, counter-transference phenomenon all the time. Um, in some, for example, in, in the case of, of transference, a child who maybe had a very abusive father and very physically abusive, psychologically abusive, and, and, and so the relationship with the father was very um, fraught. You know, wanting to be close to the father, but not, uh, but but also being abused by the father, and so that relationship is a very complex, messy relationship. And what a child in those cases often does is they develop a fantasy that, oh, if if I had a good father like Billy over there has, this nice father who does all these wonderful things for me, then 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 things would be better. So transference can also be. A transference of a, of a say an abused child's fantasy of a good parent, you know, and so this abused child who's now maybe an adult or teenager or something gets a coach who represents all those good things that he wanted to have when he was a child from his father, and so there's this this falling in love with <laughs> this fantasy father transference of a of a fantasy that was never fulfilled, and so that's another way in which transference works and we see we see athletes falling in love with their coaches all all the time in different types of ways but you often one of the most one of the most lovely things to see is is somebody coming from an abusive background meeting a coach who's loving and caring and then that person just blossoming because they're not they're no longer afraid and they're no longer worried they're no, no longer threatened they actually have a what you could call is a a type of healing of their relationship with their dad or mother with, with this new coach. So it's, it's, it's a healing, it can be a healing. The transference process can be a healing process. And um, we see that, you see that often, you know, especially with abused children with a teacher. They just fall in love with their teachers because a teacher represents what they wanted in life, what they wanted out of their parents but never got. And so those, uh, I think, the number of examples for transference and countertransference are gigantic. They're, they're everywhere. Wow. Interesting. So there's there can be this blossoming, but are there also then risks? Oh, oh I, there's, there's lots of risks with transference and countertransference, especially when they're very powerful and emotional. Uh, and some of the risks there are when it, move, when it moves over into, into intimacy sexual intimacy then then the lines get all blurred and it, it's usually quite damaging so there's there you need to be careful of transference and countertransference phenomena you need to be able to see them when they're happening and address them when they're happening because and so there are um, and there are also phenomena transference phenomena where the the, the child uh, it's it's a negative transference I'm, I'm taking all the stuff with my abusive father and I'm transferring it over here to my relationship with my abusive coach and so it's, I'm having the same type of relationship not a healing one but I've got an abusive coach who's now just repeating I'm repeating everything that happened with my dad so I'm I'm anxious I feel threatened I may be acting out I may be doing all sorts of things that because of my past history that I bring to this new situation Oh, I see. So it's, it's not only the, for 
positive. Oh, there's plenty of negative results from transference and countertransference. Yeah, and it can be t- t- what's kind of a negative model. Yeah. That, that, that yeah. Approach. And it's sort of like what happens with some many ab- abused people. They themselves become abusers. They that that's the model that they have, and they or they or they connect to a partner who is abusive because that's the model they have and it sort of perpetuates the abuse mm. and so so we hope that, that through therapy through good coaching through good teaching that people have the, have these what you could call corrective or healing emotional experiences with another person rather than a reenactment of the damaging relationship they had with somebody earlier in their life so yeah and then we touch about touch upon the subject but so what why is it so important with transfer and the understanding of transference well I guess, I guess the, for the for a psychologist to understand transference is quite a few different reasons why it's important one of the first ones is if for the psychologist to really understand the client, uh, it would be good to understand how the client is transferring to the psychologist, or especially if it's a negative transference. So what am I do? What am I doing that s- makes my client see me in this negative light? So, you know, and so that we can, I can do something different to help to help them. These two people connect with each other. Um, it's sort of understanding uh, understanding a person's relationship history is is really understanding how they got to be who they are. So if we really want to understand our clients, it's probably a good idea to try to understand their relationship history. Um, also, especially for countertransference, if my countertransference is coming into play, I need to be aware of it so that I don't do things that maybe are not helpful or maybe damaging. Is like, for example, if my protective sort of countertransference to athletes comes into play, then what what I, what I may do is I may I may do too much for them, or I may try to help them too much, or I may try to, you know, maybe I become intrusive even and in trying to protect them, and maybe I go overboard with it because that's my history of trying to take care and be protective of my sisters, and so I need to be careful that my stuff doesn't mess up the relationship or mess up the therapy so we so it's a good idea to be to be aware of, of my own stuff so that i don't so that i'm helpful to the client and don't do things that are going to be unhelpful ah, so if i understand it correct if if i'm working with the client and i notice myself doing more and more and helping the client out and starting to think about what protecting the client yeah. s- somehow then then uh, there should be a, a signal in my head telling me that yeah be aware of the yeah. little yellow uh, little yellow card comes up yellow and says Arne what are you doing Arne <laughs> why are you doing that Arne yeah. you know, and, and so it it come it probably a lot of trans counter transference phenomena come from a good helpful place but we don't want to let them be intrusive. And um, in Bratislava, mm-hmm. at, at uh, this uh, pleasant conference, you you ended your workshop there of transference with um, with a supervis- supervision session where you invi- invited the audience and one uh, very friendly Italian sports psychologist came down mm-hmm. and sat like this yes. and uh, and you discussed uh, yeah you 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 discussed the case mm-hmm. uh, where she got to present her case to you as yeah. a supervisor mm-hmm. and I, f- I from the audience watched it and th- thought it was very interesting all that happened mm-hmm. from your perspective could you describe the situation and uh, what do you think happened during this supervision session okay um, one have to have to remember that this is a, a supervision uh, session in front of an audience and so how that influenced how the supervision went, um, I'm not sure, but it, it has an influence on that. Uh, for example, if I'm, if I'm doing supervision just like one-on-one, um, 
I don't have an audience that is, that's out in front of me. And even I sit there, well, now, oh, my goodness, now I've got, oh, now I've got to perform. <laughs> so it actually, I actually became anxious to you know, put my skills on display. Even though I've been doing this for years and years and years, I still felt a bit anxious. And I also felt anxious for the person I was talking with because uh, supervision especially in discussing transference and counter-transference, supervision is actually quite an intimate thing to do, to talk about one's own feelings for one's clients and where they may come from and one's own history. And so I was anxious for myself from a very narcissistic point of view that I needed to look intelligent and very smart and all that shit. And then I was anxious for her because I thought, well, this supervision could go to places that would leave her talking about things that may might she might feel vulnerable in front of an audience and so it's quite an unnatural thing to do but there's still a whole lot of of, of stuff that can occur that did occur in there that uh, is typical of supervision of transference and countertransference and that there's often the presentation of a story and then about an athlete and then the, the supervisee tells the story and then I may ask some questions to fill out the story and the questions I usually ask are, the, are not so much um, about the linear story of the athlete but more about the um, psychologist's responses to the athlete and you know what, what do they how do they feel about them or what does the, who does the athlete remind them of or in the case of this one she had some feelings of she liked the athlete quite a lot, but she also was quite irritated at the athlete. And, and then so, we, so when that emotion came up of irritation, we said, well, where, does, where do you think that emotion came from? Have you felt that way with another client before, with another person in your life before? Trying to find out where this emotional response from the, the psychologist came from. And, and, and so we got, <clears throat> we got to the emotional part and then as we explored even more, we, it came to, came to light some stuff about the client's, uh, about the client's mother and the relationship with the client to his mother was a bit complex or fraught or we didn't get into details, but there were some difficulties there. And so, so I asked her about, well, he's got problems with mom. Do you feel maternal toward him? You know, do, you, do you feel, is your counter-transference to him something of you want, to, you want to be a good mum to him in some way? You want to sort of fix his problem with his mum by being... And that didn't quite resonate with her. It didn't feel, feel right. So my suggestion or possible interpretation didn't go. And that happens in, in supervision all the time. I may make a suggestion or I may make an interpretation about transference and counter-transference to uh, uh, one of my supervisees and they'll say, that's it, exactly, that's how I feel. Or they may say, no, that doesn't feel right. <laughs> so they don't always work, but, uh, but uh, and, that, and that's part of the fascination of doing supervision is you're sort of exploring, making an interpretation, seeing if it fits. If it doesn't fit, well then maybe maybe something else is going on and we can look at it in a different way. Uh, so there was a lot of things in that, in that role play that are, do happen in supervision of transference and counter-transference. And then there were also a bunch of elements that were foreign and were probably intruding. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you, you sometimes stopped the, the session and yeah. said, okay, look here, what's happened now, yeah. we go from a cognitive story to, to an emotional to one, emotional one yeah. and then you stopped, so yeah, it uh, was a special situation, but from, from, for me as an audience, I thought it, were, it went very well, or it felt like a real session mm. um, from that kind of situation, so I, I thought it was really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was fun to do. <laughs> and she was very generous in being quite honest about her emotional responses. But she's also uh, trained in psychoanalysis. Yeah, yeah true, <laughs> true. Uh, so I is this how it usually looks when you do sessions? 
Um, it, it it differs. Every 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 supervisee I have is pro we probably do things a little differently. Um, but if when it comes down to talking about transference and countertransference, some of those basic questions are: How does that person? How do you feel about that person? What what do you what does that person remind you of somebody? What's your emotional response to that person? What, what's your cognitive response to that person? Would you like to be closer to that person? You know, what, what, and if you would, why? What, what about it makes you want to be closer? Or what irritates you in this case? What irritates you about this person? What is it? Let's explore your irritation now. Think about the person, become irritated, and let's talk about what that feels like and what that may be related to. But those, those sorts of questions are the basic ones around exploring my supervisee's transferences. Cool. And uh, if you uh, watch this video now and you get more interested, oh, I want to get uh, learn more about transference and counter-transference. Mm -hmm. As a sports psychology practitioner, w is there anything you, uh, you should read or go or do uh, to be more aware of it? There, there's, there's not, as I said, there's not a lot of, of uh, literature written on transference and counter-transference in sports psychology. Um, I've probably done half of it. <laughs> uh, you can type in, you know, in a literature search, counter-transference sports psychology, and, and um, if you if you type in just transference sports psychology, it'll you'll get all these things about transference, transferring lear learning from one situation to wow. another, or transferring no, you know, something. So counter-transference is a better one to look up. Counter transference sports psychology, um, and um, if anybody's interested, I can send them some of the stuff that I've written. So if you want to, at the end of this, if you want to give them my email address, yeah, I'll I'm, put I'm, it in below. I'm happy to send them an article or two on transference and counter transference. Oh, that's really nice. Yeah. Cool. So yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, both for the cool workshop with mm -hmm. Bratislava and for being here and doing this interview here at Halsted University. It's my pleasure.